Rotating detonation combustion has been shown to be a promising technology for achieving pressure gain combustion and its associated increased efficiency goals. However, many researchers have observed operating modes that do not match the canonical description of RDC operation, including the potential for longitudinal pulsations. This work will therefore explore the presence and stabilization mechanisms of these longitudinal modes. My name is Maus Bohan from TU Berlin, and I'm presenting on behalf of my co-authors, Richard Blumner, Effie Gutmark, and Oliver Pascherite. The combustor design for an RDC is a very simple structure. It is composed of an annular combustion chamber around the perimeter of which a detonation wave propagates. Reactants are injected at the head end and products exhaust out the aft end to produce thrust or drive turbo machinery. Here we see a cross section of the combustor used in this study. Air and fuel are injected separately with the air entering through a slot around the base of the annulus and the fuel through discrete injector holes. The flame is stabilized around the base of the combustor. Since our objective is to investigate the longitudinal modes, this combustor has also been designed to incorporate components to vary the length of the combustor, as well as the outlet restriction as indicated in the figure. Let's begin our study with a case where everything is business as usual. Here, we see the initiation of the detonation wave and the stabilization to steady state. When we switch to a high-speed camera, imaging the flame luminosity, we can see a steadily propagating wave fitting the classical idea of the RDC. However, several distinct deviations from this mode can be observed, and we will focus on two of them. In case one, the primary detonation wave is joined by a counter-rotating secondary wave. While it is difficult to observe the proposed longitudinal characteristics in this case from the video, we will shortly show how the longitudinal mode is expressed in the pressure traces. In case two, the longitudinal pulsations become much stronger and are very clearly visible in this high-speed video. One can see that there is some rotating component However, the dominant feature is an azimuthly distributed global fluctuation in the flame luminosity. We will explore both of these cases in detail. However, first as a reference, we can estimate the frequencies of the transverse and longitudinal acoustic modes in the combustor. The transverse modes are calculated for a thin annular duct with acoustically hard walls. Both the tangential and radial modes can be calculated based on the speed of sound in the combustor, the annular geometry, and the roots of the first derivative of the associated vessel functions. Calculated values in this work will be shown as a band with limits for the speed of sound in detonation and deflagration products, which should help account for some of the uncertainty in the combustion characteristics. Meanwhile, the longitudinal modes can be calculated as standing waves of fractional wavelengths. Here, an important consideration is the acoustic boundary condition at the ends of the combustor. The injection end of the combustor can reasonably be assumed to be a closed or fully reflecting end. The acoustic boundary at the outlet, however, can vary depending on operating condition. For mass flow rates that are not sufficient to choke the outlet, the outlet behaves as an open end and will exhibit a quarter wave resonance. When the outlet is choked, similarly to rocket combustors, the outlet will behave as a closed end and will exhibit a half wave resonance. The resonant frequency at these conditions should then be corrected by the average Mach number in the combustor. We can now begin analyzing our first type of longitudinal mode. Here we see the high-speed video as well as a space-time diagram of the luminosity. In the average luminosity plot below, we can see the fluctuation about the mean associated with the intersection of the counter-rotating waves occurring at a frequency near 8 kHz. However, we then later see a periodic variation in the intensity of these intersections at a lower frequency superimposed over the fluctuations. We can compare the pressure traces measured in the wall of the combustor with the global luminosity. From the Fourier spectrum of the pressure traces, we can identify the frequencies of the two rotating waves at about 4,100 and 3,900 Hz. These waves will intersect at the sum of their frequencies, and indeed we can observe a peak in luminosity spectrum at around 8,000 Hz. At the same time, we can observe a strong peak around 2,100 Hz in the luminosity, and a smaller peak at the same frequency in the pressure traces, both of which coincide with the calculated quarter wave frequency L4. We therefore need to ask, under what conditions do we see this new mode? To answer this, we varied the combustor geometry, shown here as the combustor length over the perimeter, and studied a range of mass flow rates and outlet boundaries. At each condition, we identified the rotational components in the pressure and high-speed video measurements, and we were able to identify this region where we observed this mode corresponding to the quarter wave mode. This L4 mode is observed at every combustor length, however, only when the mass flow is sufficiently low to not choke the outlet. Meanwhile, as we vary the length of the combustor, the calculated quarter wave frequency will also vary as shown in the blue shaded region. We can then compare our measured frequency in the blue markers and see that our observations agree very well with the expected values. For reference, this plot has been normalized by the frequency of the first tangential mode, which also agrees well with the measured frequency of the rotating component plotted in black. 
from the strong correlation of measured and expected frequencies for various combustor lengths, as well as the occurrence only under low mass flow rates, we can conclude that this first type of longitudinal mode is clearly associated with the quarter wave resonance and the acoustics of the combustor. Therefore, we propose the following mechanism for the stabilization of this system. First, a collision of two opposed waves results in a strong interaction leading to a wave that propagates the length of the combustor. At a quarter of the period, the wave reflects from the open end, resulting in a phase shift of 180 degrees and the upstream propagation of a weaker wave. This wave returns to the injector face at the same time as the rotating components have returned. However, at this intersection, the returning longitudinal wave is weaker following the phase shift, resulting in a weaker rotating wave interaction. The second half of the cycle follows the first, however at three quarters of the longitudinal wave period, as the wave reaches the open end, it experiences another 180 degrees phase shift and returns as a stronger wave, thus completing the cycle. This variation of stronger and weaker rotating wave collisions is exactly as observed in the high-speed video. The second type of longitudinal mode we would like to examine is more obviously expressed in the high-speed video than in the first. Here, we see the significant variation in the global intensity distributed around the perimeter of the combustor. Some small rotating components can still be seen, however they are less steady and appear to be dependent on the global oscillation. When we follow the same procedure as before, comparing the globally averaged luminosity with the measured pressure traces, we can see very similar trends between the two measurements. The luminosity and pressure measurements are strongly correlated in the time domain. Additionally, the azimuthally distributed pressure traces do not show the sequential characteristics normally observed in a rotating wave. In the Fourier spectrum, the luminosity and pressure spectra have peaks at the same frequency, around 5 kHz, which coincides well with the estimated half-wave frequency, L2. As before, we then follow the same variation in combustor length, shown as length over perimeter, as well as combustor outlet geometry. We repeat this for a range of reactant mass fluxes. When we identify the operating mode characteristics, we observe that this L2 mode occurs within a different region of the operating map than the L4. First and foremost, it only occurs under conditions with a greater outlet restriction. And when it does occur, it is confined to a region of length over perimeter of around 0.45 to 0.55, and for regions of higher mass flow rate. When we examine the operating mode as a function of the reactant mass flux for different outlet restrictions, we observe that the L2 mode occurs once the mass flow is sufficient to choke the outlet when a restriction is used. However, without a restriction, outlet choking does not appear to be sufficient to induce this mode. Additionally, there appears to be a region in the operating map, just as the outlet chokes, where the combustor becomes unstable and the flame extinguishes, which could reasonably be associated with this transition from a primarily rotating to a primarily longitudinal operating mode. Just as in the quarter wave mode case, we can compare the calculated half wave mode resonance frequency, shown in the blue stripe, with our measured frequencies as we change the length of the combustor. Here again, we see the very strong correlation between theory and experiment. Therefore, it appears that as the combustor length approaches a length of a perimeter of about 0.5, the acoustics of the L2 mode are sufficient to entrain and dominate the rotating component. As the length of the combustor is further increased, the operating frequency follows the L2 mode until the entrainment is no longer sufficient and the rotating components can again dominate. This length of a perimeter ratio of 0.5 is significant in that assuming a uniform speed of sound throughout the combustor, a wave could complete a lap around the annulus in the same time as a wave would propagate down the length of the combustor and back. To support this idea, we can observe the propagation of pressure waves down and around the combustor by distributing pressure sensors along its length. From these measurements, we build up a picture of the space-time pressure distribution in the combustor. Here, we will start with a simple rotating case. The pressure magnitudes are painted in the black and red field for four different pressure sensors along the length of the combustor. The injector end of the combustor is on the left, and the exhaust is on the right. The rotating wave is stabilized in the vicinity of the leftmost strip. The primary detonation wave and the subsequent oblique shock can be seen throughout the length of the combustor by tracing the periodic light-colored regions in the pressure field, indicating periodic pressure peaks. The rotating wave structure can then be identified by the green line in the figure. When we extend this process to a case with a L2 longitudinal component, the pressure field is a bit less orderly. We can still identify a weak rotating component marked in green, however we can also trace the pressure peaks of the longitudinally propagating wave marked with the blue lines. We can see at the injector end, the pressure wave for the blue line begins very intense and propagates down the length of the combustor at a high speed, where it reflects and returns upstream. 
However, during this process, the strength of the wave slowly decays before being reinitiated and restarting the cycle. From this wave tracing, we can then determine the speed of the wave as it propagates downstream and upstream in the combustor. When we plot this up and downstream measured velocity, shown in the gray markers, we need to account for the bulk velocity of the reactant flow. We can calculate this as half the difference in the downstream and upstream velocities, which we plot in blue. These values agree very well with the estimated bulk velocity considering the set mass flow rate, measured combustor pressure, and estimated post-deflagration or post-detonation product temperature and composition. When we adjust the measured up and downstream velocities by the estimated bulk velocity, on top of which these waves are propagating, which we will plot in the red markers, we see that these wave speeds are very close to the speed of sound in the products. This result further supports the idea that this mode is associated with the acoustics of the combustor. Consequently, one can reason that this mode is not supported by a downstream propagating detonation wave, despite the high downstream velocity in the laboratory frame, but rather an acoustic or shock wave that's superimposed on the non-negligible bulk velocity. Therefore, we propose the following as the stabilization mechanism for this half-wave mode. A semi-uniformly distributed mixture of reactants explodes or reignites, sending a shock wave down the length of the combustor. Since the mass flow rate is sufficient to choke the exhaust outlet, yielding a closed acoustic boundary, which is combined with the hard physical outlet restriction, the wave reflects. Meanwhile, fresh reactants are refilling semi-uniformly around the combustor annulus until the reflected wave again reaches these fresh reactants. Here, the wave is either strong enough to ignite the mix through the first pass, or it is necessary for the wave to first shock process the reactants and then reflect from the injector face and process the reactants again. In either case, the explosion of the mixture restarts the cycle. In this work, we have investigated two forms of longitudinal instabilities. In both, we showed the presence of a thermoacoustic modes, coupling the acoustics of the combustion chamber with the heat release of the combustion wave. Consequently, several design considerations can be concluded. From the quarter wave modes, we showed that they appear only under low mass flow conditions when the outlet is non-reflecting. Under certain conditions, this mode may actually help stabilize and support the combustion. However, when L over P is sufficiently high, the reflected wave may be either too weak or too late to support the intersection rotating waves. From the half-wave modes, we showed that a combustor aspect ratio of L over P equaling 0.5 should be avoided to prevent entrainment into this longitudinal mode. We also demonstrated the mechanism by which the shock wave, resulting from the explosion of the reactant mixture, is able to propagate the length of the combustor and return to restart the cycle. For further information, we invite you to check out our recent publications on RDC operating modes as well as several other recent publications on related RDC performance metrics. Thank you.